So these kind of uh, systems have recently become of great excitement, as you know, because it has been theoretically predicted uh, quite some time ago by various uh, theory groups that if you bring a helical magnetic spin chain in contact to an S-wave superconductor, you can actually by proximity induce a topological superconducting phase in this spin chain. And it was predicted that at the ends of such spin chains you might see the emergence of uh, zero energy modes which are assigned to these Majorana modes and they should uh, actually uh, show up first of all as a peak at zero energy here when you look at the local density of states as a function of energy and of course these modes should be highly localized at the ends of the spin chain meaning uh, that if you look with spatial resolution you should only see these modes at the ends of the chain so these should be the signatures but uh, not of course the only signatures and it's pretty obvious that uh, these kind of model type platforms are ideal to look at with techniques like scanning tunneling microscopy and related scanning probe techniques which allow actually to combine energy resolution and very high spatial resolution. So it's an alternative platform to the semiconductor nanowire approach we ha which we have heard about uh, in the talk uh, yesterday morning and uh, it's certainly uh, actually of uh, great interest to look into these alternative platforms. Actually there have been several reports already where groups uh, try to realize actually these model type systems as they have been assumed theoretically. Uh, for instance, uh, there have been reports by the Princeton group of Ali Azdani already three years back in time based on self-assembled iron chains which uh, were actually grown on a LED 110 substrate and uh, probed with scanning tunneling microscopy. Now you see that uh, these chains are far from being ideal and the reason is that uh, in order to prepare such chains you have to deposit iron from a gas phase in ultra high vacuum onto a well prepared LED 110 surface. This surface has twofold symmetry so in principle it favors actually the growth of one dimensional structures. However in order to do this you have to anneal your system. And that's a problem because if you introduce thermal energy to the system you easily get intermixing between iron and lead. And it's very well known in the surface science community and we are talking about the age of the interface that lead is a surfactant. So I'm myself coming from the surface science area and we used lead for a long time as surfactant and we all know that if you put something on lead and you anneal it you will get lead on top and not iron. So uh, you also see clearly the signature of intermixing because you see these blobs here on top of these chains and you also see a lot of disorder along the chain. So this is the problem. Nevertheless, the group has seen clear indications for an enhanced zero bias conductance at the ends of the chain and this has been reported here in this work where they studied basically spatially resolved the local density of states as probed with uh, STM and uh, two years later they also reported about uh, experiments where they have improved on the energy resolution and the spatial resolution and they concluded that uh, this feature seen at the ends of the chain is actually a double eye feature and as you can see the double eye feature is seen experimentally here within the chain and not right at the end and they could reproduce this theoretically by assuming a very complex structure of this chain. So it's not a single atom chain which uh, they uh, considered here but it's a, a so-called zigzag chain, zigzag in the vertical direction so to say because this is a side view. So you have iron atoms embedded in the lead substrate, you have also uh, uh, iron atoms embedded in the surface plane and you have iron atoms on top. That's the assumed structure and with that they could reproduce this double I feature and report about this in this publication. However, if you look at the traces of the zero bias uh, co uh, tunneling conductance which is a measure of uh, uh, zero energy local density of states, 
you immediately see that apart from this peak, which of course corresponds to these features here, there's a very irregular uh, signal here along uh, the chain. And this clearly tells you that this cannot be the truth here because if you would have an ideal periodic chain, no matter what the structure is, you should have a periodic signal, of course, also in the conductance curve. So meaning whatever these features are, they could be my runner states, they could be defect related states, uh, it's clear that uh, what has been experimentally addressed in this community is not what has been actually assumed theoretically. That's a clear conclusion up to now and so you have to look into other kind of approaches experimentally in order to realize exactly the situation which is of course assumed theoretically and which you can see in all the publications so far uh, addressing these kind of platforms for my runner state. So all the people draw basically these idealized chains here uh, where you have basically a single magnetic atom chain here of finite length. You have of course your superconducting substrate and you uh, basically can expect that you have Shiba states then forming here and at the end you might see the emergence of these by runner states. So that's the hope and of course the model type platform which has been addressed theoretically. Now how to achieve this experimentally? Self-assembly on lead is certainly not a good approach as I just motivated. You will never get well-defined chains this way. However, in the STM community it's uh, very well known that you can assemble such uh, model type systems atom by atom. And this is known since the early 90s, since the pioneering work of Don Eigler, who has shown for the first time that you can use an atomically sharp STM tip to uh, basically construct chains here on various kinds of metal substrates. And this is of course the tool which you should use in order to construct such model type platforms. Now, we have contributed to this development of single atom manipulation by showing for the first time that you can really do this single atom manipulation also with a spin sensitive tip and with magnetic atoms while preserving the spin state of both the front atom of the probe tips as well as the spin state of the magnetic atoms on the surface. That was first reported seven years back in time. And this is of course extremely important if you want to address magnetic states now of atomic scale systems. You should be able to construct such magnetic model type platforms and you should be able to characterize the spin states as well with atomic level resolution. And of course if you want to do so step by step, meaning atom by atom, you should of course make sure that the spin state of your spin sensitive probe tip is not changing otherwise you cannot say anything uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, real value. So let me show you that we have gained a lot of experience in this field over the past 10 years because we have been looking at non-collinear spin texture and this is exactly what is assumed theoretically that you have a non-collinear helical magnetic state. We have learned over the last years even to tailor such uh, non-collinear spin chains based on single atom manipulation. And I'm going to show you this first on a non-superconducting substrate, however a substrate with high spin orbit coupling, namely platinum 111. So we have put down here iron atoms on a platinum 111 substrate and we are going to make use of single atom manipulation to construct a chain which is defect free. It only includes iron atoms. We have a very well defined spacing which is always reproduced here and we couple such a spin chain now to a ferromagnetic cobalt island here. This is uh, because we want to fix the spin orientation of the first atom here by RKKY interaction here to the magnetization orientation in this uh, cobalt nanostructure here. And then we would like to study, of course, the spin state of this chain as a function of the number of the atom along the chain. This is shown here. So this is a spin resolved tunneling conductance image where the color coding refers, refers to the strength of the spin signal. And you can see if we go from this end to that end, 
you see here first a low spin resolved conductance signal, then a much larger signal, a lower signal, larger signal. So it seems uh, to be quite periodic. However, you see here that there are two atoms which uh, basically show uh, the same strength of the spin related signal. So it cannot be, for instance, a collinear and a ferromagnetic state, which we are seeing here, but it's a more complex state. And you also see this clearly if you look at the profile now along this chain that you see here in the profile along the chain now a beating pattern which results from the superposition of two spatial frequencies. And these two spatial frequencies on one hand have their origin in a short range antiferromagnetic order which is uh, basically coming from the fact that we have chosen a distance which prefers an antiferromagnetic coupling uh, because of the RKKY interaction via the platinum substrate. However, on top of that, there's a long-range modulation which is basically coming from the interfacial scherzinsky maria interaction. And uh, this uh, actually is the reason why we observe basically here this rather complex non-collinear spin state and you see that uh, this uh, uh, kind of spin uh, model structure here reproduces then the experimental profile pretty well. So we have basically a 216 degree spin rotation from one atom to the other. I'm sorry, um, the cobalt atoms were not visible. Was it, why was that? The spin, the spin polarization was in another thing? Uh, here, there's uh, the cobalt actually. Why don't they Oh, simply because uh, this is a contrast where we are making use of the uh, constant current mode to see basically the profile. And this constant current mode, of course, you have superimposed uh, the height, of course, of the atom. If you want to uh, see exclusively the spin contrast on all the levels, uh, you would have to do the experiment where you uh, basically detect uh, this image with a spin-sensitive tip where the spin is aligned in one direction or the other. I just uh, come to this. Uh, however, we can of course uh, study this. Uh, we have done so. I can't show all the data. So of course we have also flipped the magnetization of this cobalt island to prove the magnetic origin of the contrast. But I'm just going to show you this even uh, in a much uh, more impressive way. This is for instance the case when we replace the cobalt nanostructure just by a three atom iron cluster. This free atom iron cluster actually uh, is quite stable magnetically, at least at the temperature of the experiment, which is 300 millikelvin in this case. And here we construct again the same type of chain with the same spacing of the atoms of 8.3 angstroms. And now you see uh, basically here the switching of the magnetic state of this free atom cluster. And you see whenever the magnetic state of this cluster switches, you also of course see the switching here of the uh, spin uh, texture here along the chain. So this is the ultimate proof of course of the magnetic origin of the signal. You also see again here the preferred antiferromagnetic coupling, however, with the superimposed charzinski maria interaction. Now if you want to construct a chain which has a different type of uh, spin spiral, we can, for instance, uh, go to smaller separations of the atoms, only 5.5 uh, angstroms, for instance. Then it's clear that you prefer, in the end, the ferromagnetic coupling, because iron is a well-known ferromagnet, and indeed, you see now preferentially the same contrast of neighboring atoms. However, it's not the same contrast along the chain. You see here uh, a drastic enhancement of the spin contrast here as well. So what you have is basically here a superposition of short-range ferromagnetic coupling superimposed with a non-collinear spin texture coming from the interfacial charzinski maria interaction. And of course... Sorry, is there any constraint on the distance between the atoms by the substrate? I mean, can you arbitrarily not? Uh, of course, you have to uh, match to uh, certain adsorption sites. You cannot uh, uh, change distances, say, by a uh, fraction of an angstrom. You always have to match with uh, some preferential adsorption sites. So, for instance, you can increase the distance here. This was done here towards 1.39 nanometer. Then uh, the RKKY type coupling is relatively small and uh, basically uh, the state is uh, primarily governed by the interfacial DMI interaction. 
So of course you cannot uh, uh, realize an arbitrary distance, but uh, the kind of distances you can achieve is actually uh, quite large because you cannot only have HCP adsorption sites, you can have FCC adsorption sites, you can go along a, a main crystallographic direction or slightly off, so you can actually realize quite a lot of distances. So we can tune all that and we have learned really to tailor non-collinear magnetic chains and we are even now do, doing this in two dimensions to construct from the bottom up skirmionic textures, you know, we have studied skirmionic textures in fin films quite a while. Here we have basically the possibility to tune this from the bottom up. Now let's uh, exchange the substrate. This was all done on a non-superconducting substrate, however still uh, already with um, high spin orbit coupling. Now if we want to do this now on a superconductor, we are going to the periodic table of elements and of course uh, we know that uh, a number of elements do not have uh, superconducting states. Uh, uh, some of them only show superconducting states under pressure. This is not what we wish to have for our experiments, so we neglect those elements and uh, we are ending up with these elements here. Now, uh, since we want to have a sufficiently large gap to look at uh, the states within the gap, we would like to have a superconducting substrate, say, with a transition temperature above 1 Kelvin. That was basically uh, what we uh, said. And then we can neglect those elements here. Uh, so we are ending up with uh, these elements here. And uh, if we want to have high spin orbit coupling, then, of course, we are ending up with those elements here in this uh, um, uh, <coughs> line here. And uh, as I already said, uh, among those elements, we basically uh, should uh, uh, neglect lead because of the problems with preparation and, in addition, the problem with single ladder manipulation. In fact, it turns out that lead is not only a good choice with respect to self-assembly, but it's also basically impossible to do reproducible single atom manipulation on lead. We also neglect thallium for the reason that this is quite a toxic material. So we are ending up with those three elements. And these are the three elements we have been focusing on over the past three to four years. I don't have time to go into all the results. We have constructed chains, well-defined chains on all these elements already. I only have time to focus on the rhenium, which from a surface science point of view is the best choice among these three elements because uh, this is a system which you can clean up most easily among those three elements. So if we now deposit uh, single magnetic atoms, of course we first have to know uh, what is happening if we deposit a single magnetic atom on a superconductor. This will be addressed in more detail this afternoon by Katharina Franke and also uh, other uh, speakers later on. So uh, most importantly, if you put a magnetic atom on a superconductor, uh, you will see basically the emergence of uh, so-called Shiba bound states or U Shiba Rusinov bound states. And the binding energies of these states, which are actually located within the gap of the superconductor, uh, is actually dependent here on uh, two important parameters, namely the spin S of the magnetic impurity and the exchange coupling strength J of the magnetic impurity spin to the superconductor. And this is of course something which you can tune on one hand by the choice of the magnetic atom but also the choice of the substrate. And so you will see that this binding energy can really be relatively large meaning that uh, you have basically uh, these kind of Shiba states uh, uh, superimposed onto the coherence peaks of a superconductor or the binding energy can be very small sometimes so that these states are located basically uh, close to the Fermi level. This really depends on the particular type of states. It's also important to note that these Shiba states also uh, come uh, with pairs of spin up electrons and spin down holes. So for a fixed spin orientation you have fully polarized states here uh, which we have uh, recently been studying with spin polarized scanning tunneling spectroscopy. So you will see uh, soon a paper on, on this topic. Now if we really look experimentally uh, on these systems of single iron atoms on the substrate we first recognize that there is a huge difference 
whether we have the iron atoms on an HCP or an FCC adsorption site. So here is really the point where surface science comes in, uh, here also to the field of superconductivity. First of all, we see in the constant current STM topographic profile a slight difference of apparent height of these two atoms in the inequivalent adsorption sites. Uh, this is uh, some observation which has not so uh, great implications. However, even more important is the fact that in the spectroscopy we see a huge difference. So these Shiba states which I just explained have a completely different type of uh, appearance for iron atoms on HCP sites. This is the red spectrum now where we basically have here a plot of the differential tunneling conductance measured above these atoms and uh, here the bias voltage applied between tip and substrate. We see that uh, these iron atoms on the HCP sites have a completely different uh, appearance than uh, the iron atoms on the uh, FCC sites shown in blue. In black you see basically the reference spectrum uh, which is measured above the rhenium substrate. If we subtract the rhenium substrate then we have basically these different spectra here and you see clearly that there's a two component structure here uh, for the iron atoms on the FCC side which is clearly seen for this peak which is basically showing up right at the Fermi level it's hard to see uh, that this has a two component structure if you use a normal metal tip like platinum iridium tips. However there's a trick to improve on the energy resolution which was introduced by several groups like Jewish group at Tsinghua University, Katharina Franke and many others, namely the use of superconducting tips. If you are doing this then you have basically superconductor vacuum superconducting tunneling and you can profit from the uh, peaked uh, uh, density of states uh, at the coherence peaks here of the uh, tip. Uh, which is superconducting here in this case we are using uh, niobium tips and we basically see here then much uh, improved energy resolution here. So for instance if you have a niobium tip just tunneling to the rhenium substrate we see this kind of spectrum on one side here where we see uh, of course here at the summit and the difference of the two energy gaps we speak uh, uh, structures and we can extract quantitatively the superconducting gaps here of the rhenium and the niobium tip which is uh, shown here. And now if we look to these uh, Shiba states you recognize now that we can clearly resolve not only the two component structure of a Shiba state for the iron atom on the FCC side but also on the HCP side. You have to look very close, actually this is a bias uh, window of only one milli uh, electron volt here. So uh, the separation of the two components of the Shiba state is just 20 microelectron volt. And you see we can basically resolve these 20 microelectron volts here with the STM at uh, millikelvin temperatures and with superconducting tips actually we went even further down in the energy resolution. So that's fantastic that you can have single atom sensitivity, atomic resolution, microelectron volt energy resolution and of course spin sensitivity as I will show you. Even more important of course what you can do, you can first use single atom manipulation to construct dimers and see the onset of hybridization between the Shiba states. So you see clearly if you compare the iron atom here on the HCP sites with the iron dimer which was constructed here that uh, the Shiba states basically shift now to an energy of 0.11 milli electron volt and you see again this two component structure this is with a normal metal tip again you can do this with a superconducting tip and, uh, but you see immediately uh, that there's a drastic change due to hybridization. You can study this of course now as a function of number of atoms in the chain and you can really, I don't have time to go into this, you can really see nicely the emergence of a Shiba band in one dimensional chains. For that of course you have to continue now with the construction of these chains with your tip and we are going to do this with, uh, with a perfectly clean substrate we will create a perfect chain where we make sure that all these atoms are indeed iron atoms and uh, of course we have then the possibility in the end not only to create linear chains but all types of model type structures. So let uh, me show you now the sequence here of a 
construction of a 40 atom chain here of iron all sitting on HCP sites, so we control the adsorption site at a single atom level. They all have a, a single atom spacing, which is governed, of course, by the lattice constant of the rhenium substrate, which is given here. And so in the end, we have a perfect chain. We know it has close packed structure. We know exactly the lattice constant here, because this is very well known from diffraction. We know exactly the adsorption site, and we know because we have, in the end, characterized all atoms individually, that this is indeed made of iron. And I can only tell you, I don't have time to go into this, but you will see it in the upcoming publication. If we replace one iron atom by an impurity atom, you will see already the emergence of a zero bias peak. This is what was mentioned yesterday in the first talk as well for the semiconductor nanowires, that defect states play a crucial role and they can mimic any type of zero bias conductance peak. So this model type platform is even more critical in terms of disorder because it's a single atom platform. It's different from the semiconductor nanowires. Here even a single atom matters and we have data on that. But I would also only like to show you now the results on the perfect chain. So the next step is, once you have constructed such an ideal chain, you can, of course, look at this with spin averaged STM. You don't see any corrugation here because we have been using telling parameters, which does not allow to show uh, the atomic structure. You would have to go to much higher currents, which we didn't want to do in this case, uh, because we didn't want to risk to destroy the chain. Then we go to the spin resolve mode with a spin sensitive tip. We have learned to do this over the past 30 years. We can have in-plane spin-sensitive tips and we can see very nicely here uh, now a corrugation with the same tiling parameters which is now not visible with a non-magnetic tip. This corrugation shows up even more pronounced if we use an out-of-plane spin-sensitive tip. You can also see this here in the top view representations. Again, it's a beating pattern of two spatial frequencies and the overall uh, periodicity is four atomic lattice spacings. Yeah, we started 10 minutes late actually. Uh, so four atomic lattice spacings. Now the fact that you observe spin contrast in both in-plane and out-of-plane channels already proves that you have a non-collinear spin texture, not a ferromagnetic state. Now this is reproduced by DFT calculations which tell you that basically the non-collinear state is at least by a factor of five lower in energy than a ferromagnetic state. So it really fulfills the conditions which have been assumed theoretically that you have uh, indeed here a, a spin spiral state. By the way, we calibrate our probe tips by looking at iron islands uh, on rhenium, which exhibit spiral states, which were reported last year. These spiral states basically allow to calibrate exactly the spin components in your spin sensitive tip. This is just a side remark. Now let's have a look, and these are the last slides I'm going to show. What are the results in terms of the spatially resolved spectroscopy? So what we can do is we can now measure the spectroscopy curves, that is the differential tunneling conductance, which is color coded here as a function of energy, as well as a function of spatial coordinates along the chain. Here we are still on the rhenium substrate, and here you see the onset basically of the chain. We can also, of course, subtract then the rhenium background spectrum, then you have this data. And now we can basically compare uh, five different uh, profiles. First of all, the simple topographic profile, which is shown here in black. This basically, of course, uh, shows you where the chain starts here and where it ends. Here is the spin polarized STM profile where you see the additional modulation with a four atomic lattice periodicity and a smaller wavelength here as well. So it's a beating pattern, as I said. And now we can look at basically at the conductance at different energies. And we first look here to energies which basically correspond to the Shiba states. And uh, these are uh, the two curves here. And as it should be, there is an alternation of intensity between the two Shiba states components. This means whenever one state is high in intensity, the other is lower and so on. So it's a periodic signal which is basically uh, phase shifted. Now, if we look at the zero bias conductance curve, we see 
Also periodic modulation clearly uh, in the chain center and we see in addition here dramatic enhancement of conductance at the ends of the chain here. So this is clearly different from the previous observations. So on one hand we can match basically with the magnetic periodicity. On the other hand we see that we have a perfect chain which shows a periodic signal in the conductance which of course reflects the fact that we have a perfect chain. This of course is a, a disorder type system which shows the irregular profile here. So this is a, a, in fact as it should be also uh, from the theory side. Now we can add of course the spatial resolution in more detail. We zoom into these ends of these wires and we are going basically now to go through the energy uh, which is referenced here by the Rhenium background spectrum so that you see where we are uh, with respect to the applied bias and here you see the corresponding spatial resolved maps of those states and you see that right at zero bias you see basically here uh, these very high conductances here but you also see especially if you continue that there are also here of course states and these are basically coming from Van Hove singularities of the Shiba band states which are within the wire and uh, which have of course some overlap with the zero bias conductance states. So we have to do more in order of course to see how we can actually discriminate between the different types of origins. So what you can do and this is really first time you can really go from a single atom two atoms three four nine and so on we did it for all the atoms you can go up to 40 atoms in the meantime we went up to 106 atom chains and you can really look at the spectroscopy along these chains for each chain length. And what you see here in the profiles of the zero bias conductance for these different type of chains that there needs to be a, a certain length of the chain in order uh, to develop basically this enhancement of zero bias conductance at the ends of the chain here. Very clearly seen. On the other hand you also see the emergence of this periodic signal in the center of the chain if you go to longer and longer chains. So, in order to quantify this we can basically plot the zero bias conductance here in the center of the chains as a function of chain length and compare this to the zero bias conductance at the ends of the chain which is this curve and you clearly see that around uh, about uh, 9 to 10 atom chains we see basically the shooting up of the zero bias conductance at the ends a reference to the center of the chains and then there is a saturation of the conductance here at the ends say uh, above uh, about 20 atom chains. This is of course specific for the type of magnetic atoms you are using. Now in the end I just would like to say that uh, we are at a stage now that we can really compare everything quantitatively. So we have uh, group members like Levente Rosa who are doing the DFT calculations. These systems are sufficiently simple. You can really do up initial calculations for these iron atom chains on the rhenium substrate. We know everything. We know the species, we know the adsorption site, we know the spacings and so on. So everything which is needed as an input for the DFT calculations are there. And once the DFT calculation is done, then basically you have the input parameters like the chemical potential, the exchange coupling strength, and this goes into then the model type tight binding calculations done by Tore Poske. And uh, then we can basically model exactly the system which we are looking at experimentally. And we see very nicely here, for instance, as a function of chain length, how these pairs of Majorana states here basically now show up uh, and become localized at the ends. Here we can really speak about Majorana states. Why? Because theoretically you can prove that for, for such an iron single atom chain on rhenium, you have a chemical potential and an exchange coupling constant here which gives us this point which is deeply in the topological regime. So theoretically you can prove that we are in the topological regime here. 
So of course, experimentally, we would like to go further based on these observations that we can make use of bottom-up fabrication <laughs> of these single atom chains with non-collinear spin texture. We, she, we see the clear spectroscopic signatures here of she bind end states. I would like to add that we also see, of course, condor-like states and also trivial end states which result from the electron confinement in the one-dimensional chains. However, these states uh, uh, survive above TC. So I didn't have time to show you this. For all systems we have studied, we looked at the temperature dependence here above and below TC. This is how we discriminate between different states. So in the end, of course, and this is the perspective, with this type of technique, you can easily go from a single atom chain, of course, to more complex structures which have been considered theoretically in the literature, for instance, T uh, structures here, to look at the possibility of braiding of these Majorana states. There are more uh, proposals, for instance, by Tore Poske from Hamburg of more complex network structures which allow us to do some initial type of computation with these states. This involves not only single atoms but also clusters, exactly of the type which I showed you. These clusters are also assembled atom by atom and everything is known about the magnetic properties of those clusters. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge the people involved in this work, especially Hovon Kim, who did practically all the experiments on the iron chains on rhenium. But I would also like to thank Alexandra Palacio Morales, who is also involved uh, in this topic. She is looking basically at Majorana states at the edges of two-dimensional iron islands on rhenium. And then Levente Rosa, as I said, is doing the DFT calculations, Tore Poske, the tight binding calculations, and we also have a very nice collaboration on the theory side with Dirk Moore and his team at the University of Chicago. And in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.